But this morning, Mark chapter 16. If you're there, say, Jesus is the reason for the season. Okay. As I shared, we're kind of in our, our second to last message through this series. And I want you to remember with me something that we've shared quite often all throughout this year. Kind of the goal and the intent and the heart that Mark has in sharing through the Gospel of Mark. Let me read this to you. The, the Gospel of Mark, this author says, is fast moving and hard hitting. In rapid fire succession, Mark uses specific events from Jesus' life to prove, primarily to a Roman audience at the time, that he's the Christ, the Son of God, who served and suffered and died, and we'll see specifically today that he rose again. That's the entire heart and focus behind this gospel, the gospel of Mark. And today, we're kind of having Easter at Christmas time. Today's all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And really, I would submit to you, that's why we celebrate Christmas in a very meaningful way. Because Jesus is alive. He's risen. I mean, a baby in the manger. Angels lighting up the night sky and singing glory in the highest. Shepherds in the field, Mary and Joseph with the animals, the wise men following a star and then eventually bringing gifts. All of these things are very real. And also at this time, they're very, they're very sweet, very precious it seems, very kind of warm and cuddly to our 21st century ears. But without the resurrection, that's all they are. See, in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul, someone who was radically changed by the reality of the resurrection, he shares what I would share with you, some of the most kind of concise and critical components of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Let me read a little bit of it to you. It starts in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 13. He says this, Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter, then by the 12. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. And then Paul goes on to share the significance of the resurrection, that there were a few in those days who believed and were attempting to get others to believe that the future resurrection of God's people, it wasn't a reality. So he says this, but tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ, listen to this, tune into this. If Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is, what does it say there, church? Useless. He goes on to say in verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ, they're lost if there's no resurrection. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, We are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. We're hanging our hat, so to speak, on this event. Jesus literally, physically, actually rising from the dead. Christianity is not just a good view on life. Well, it's one way to live, and if that kind of helps you get through, Paul would say right here, no, 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 it's not, it's not a good view, it's good news. It's proclaiming something that actually happened. If it's not, this is a waste of time. But he goes on to say in verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first of a great harvest of all who died. So you see, just as in death came to the world through one man, he's speaking of Adam, Adam, 
Now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another, Jesus. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised at the first of the harvest, and then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. The resurrection of Jesus is not just kind of part of the story. It's the story. Like, like this is something that sets Jesus in a class all by himself from every other person who's ever existed. Same author, different book, different audience. Paul's writing to a, a congregation in Rome. And he says this in kind of the opening of his letter. Romans chapter 1, verse 4, he says this. And he, speaking of Jesus, was shown to be the Son of God. When? When he multiplied bread and fish. When he walked on water. Well, what does he say? When he was raised from the, what does it say, church? Raised from the dead. That's what shows him to be the Son of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he is Jesus Christ our Lord. He goes on to say in that same book, chapter 6, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also have new lives. Now I know what you're thinking. You haven't read Mark 16 and you've just read a lot of scripture. Like that's a lot of scripture first thing in the morning, right? Well, here's kind of the purpose and the point of me sharing all this. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, because of that reality, all that Jesus claimed to be, and listen, if you read the New Testament with an honest eye, Jesus made some radical claims. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. He says elsewhere that he's the vine of life. Where you're going to find sustenance, satisfaction, fulfillment is in him. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. I'm the vine, of, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the, all these statements of Jesus are proved by the resurrection. And his resurrection makes it possible for us to be forgiven, to have new life. That's what Paul is saying there in Romans 6 where he writes, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now... Now we may also live new lives. It won't happen with a New Year's resolution. It happens with the resurrection of Jesus and that being new and fresh in your heart in a daily experience. That's where the power of Jesus Christ comes into one's life and changes you from the inside out because of the resurrection of Jesus. See, today it's going to be Easter at Christmas time, so to speak. Now, the resurrection of Jesus truly moves his story from being one of many throughout history to the story of history. And today we're going to step into chapter 16. And I just want to set the setting a little bit. Jesus' body has kind of been kind of hastily wrapped in grave clothes and prepared. Chapter 15 records for us and accounts for us the, the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. And his body was laid in a tomb, a borrowed tomb of a, of a wealthy, kind of upright man named Joseph, who was actually a member of the, kind of the ruling religious council of that day. And the tomb was sealed with a large stone guarded by the Romans. Now, if, if and when we're able to visit Israel again, you may visit this very location known as the, the garden tomb. This is what it looks like. And I can testify to you today that that tomb is actually empty. Say, so how do you know? I know a couple of people who've been there and checked it out. Do you recognize them? <laughs> like you can go in there and see that the tomb is empty. Well, let's jump into our text in, in verse 1 of chapter 16. I'm going to be reading, I'm going to be teaching this morning from the New Living Translation, and this is how Mark opens up this chapter. He says, on Saturday evening, when the Sabbath had ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices 
Why? Well, so they could anoint Jesus' body. See, because of the Sabbath, the, the timing of Jesus' death and burial, these three women, who, who are actually mentioned in the previous chapter, chapter 15, as kind of present at the crucifixion, kind of watching from a distance, they purchase everything once the Sabbath has ended, needed to anoint Jesus' body. Now, you might ask, what, what is it, why? What is this about? See, in that day, when someone passed, it was typical, it was common for the body to be buried immediately. And immediately there was this process, kind of with like cloth strips and sheets in which each arm and leg were, were wrapped and kind of the whole body up to the neck and, in, and kind of in between the folds there'd be packed spices and myrrh and aloes. The Gospel of John tells us that there were 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe kind of making a cocoon of Jesus' body when he was in the tomb. The head wasn't wrapped. Don't think of like a mummy. That's not what they're doing here. The, a cloth or a napkin would have covered his head. But the last thing was to have these burial spices kind of poured over the body. They're not embalming him. They're not mummifying him. Think of it like a tremendous amount of potpourri, right? Like that's what it is. It's providing a sweet smell. This is a very normal thing kind of an expected thing. And by the time everything is ready, well, like, look at what Mark says in verse 2. It's almost morning. It says, very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. And on the way there, they're asking each other, who's going to roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. I mean, I don't know if you can kind of set yourself in the sandals of the scene. It's very normal. Uh, they didn't expect to find a resurrected body. That's not what they're looking for on the third day after Jesus' death. Their expectation is the Sabbath has ended. We've kind of fulfilled our religious cultural tradition to honor the Sabbath. Jesus' body, there's still things yet to be done in preparation for it to be done for him to be buried. So they're, they're providing a loving service to someone who they love dearly. I mean, this is, these are people that loved Jesus and walked with Jesus and knew Jesus. There's really it's no sense of kind of some anticipation. They're not on tiptoe and expectation seeing if, if Jesus is resurrected. There's nothing like that. You don't find anything out of the ordinary except this dynamic that when they're walking there, they're like, oh yeah, the stone. What are we going to do about that? I mean, doesn't that seem very normal? Like if you're traveling anywhere, maybe as a husband or wife or family, and you're like, oh yeah, we forgot to feed the dog. Like that kind of dynamic. Like there's just the, the stone. We didn't think about that. that that's kind of the, the setting of this scene. And in the Greek, when it says that it's very large, do you know what that technical term means? Very large. That's what it means. Like the stone was anywhere between two to two and a half tons in weight. How's it going to be moved? But when they arrived, as they arrived, like it says there in Mark chapter 16, the stone had been rolled aside. I love what one pastor says about this. Like, why is the stone moved? Stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. He's not like pacing inside the tomb, hoping that an angel will move it. But the stone was rolled away so that witnesses could get in. Well, that's a good point. Well, verse 5, Mark records this for us, that when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and the women fully expected that. No, the women were, what does it say there? They were shocked. They were shocked. Let me put this in the NUV, Neil's uninspired version. They're freaking out. That's what the language here does kind of mean in the, in the Greek, that there's this heightened sense, this state of fear and agitation. Let me give you an example. I don't think, and if it does, I'm sorry for the trauma that you're about to experience, but I don't think that this image brings fear, agitation, worry, concern. And I don't think it freaks you out. If it does, I apologize. It's cute. It's fun. 
for some of us, it's kind of a timely movie for this time of the year. Not, definitely not, for Lainey Louise Pearl, who's two years old. She previewed a few of these scenes as some of my kids were watching this in the background the other day, and she saw Harry and Marv, are those the two guys that are part of that scene? And when she saw what was happening, this is what she says. Skip it, skip it, skip it. Like anytime that image comes up, like my kids want to watch number two. We barely got through number one, but Lainey's not having it. I mean, she literally starts shaking. Skip it, skip it. And in my mind, I don't know if that's the language that these women are using on that Sunday morning, but there's this sense of trepidation, concern, fear, anxiety, agitation. Like, like they stepped there to do a loving service to a man who did nothing but love everyone he met. And they're met by this young man. Gospel writers, as Mark will tell us in verse 6, that this is an angel, describe him. Like his garment, Luke says, is like gleaming and shining. And you may know from other gospel accounts that Luke and John say there were two angels. Matthew and Mark only mention one. Is that a problem? No, I think the angel that's mentioned is the spokesperson. There were two there, but one is speaking. And look at what he says in verse 6. Don't be alarmed. Don't skip it, right? You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now, I want you to catch this. I think it's extremely important for how you kind of walk out your own personal faith and trust and relationship with Jesus. The angel shares who Jesus was and now who he is. Say, what do you mean by that? He was crucified. He is now risen. See, he gives this name, Jesus of Nazareth. That's not like saying the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, like a place that's like, oh, Bel-Air, that's a spot. No, Nazareth, Nazareth. If you've read through the Gospels, you've heard other people, can anything good come from Nazareth? Not necessarily a title of prominence and power and prestige. Jesus of Nazareth, who died a death of capital punishment deserved by criminals. That's how the angel describes Jesus. He was crucified. I mean, for me, maybe for you, doesn't that kind of remind you of how Paul describes Jesus in Philippians 2? That he made himself of no reputation. That wasn't his shtick. It wasn't his thing. T taking on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself came obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This is who Jesus was. This is what he's done. No one here is too far gone from the grace of God because God, in human form, in humility, stepped into flesh so that he could meet you at any plane of life. This is who Jesus was. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified to pay our debt. Now, right now, he's risen in glory. That's who he is today. Not one who was merely resuscitated, brought back to life. But the only one who's ever been resurrected. As we've been going through this series together, sometimes I'll reference a Bible commentator or, you know, someone that I go, man, this is great insight. Check out what this guy says. It looks, it's very helpful in understanding this. And I want to do that once again with, with Pastor David Guzik. He says this, that there, there are several examples in the Bible of people being resuscitated before this. Mentions one in 1 Kings 17 and Lazarus there and John 11. But he says, each of them was raised in the same body they died in and raised from the dead to eventually die again. Resurrection isn't just living again. It is living again in a new body based on our old body, perfectly suited for life and eternity. Jesus was not the first one to be brought from the, back from the dead, but he was the first one to be resurrected. This is who Jesus is. Sets him apart uniquely from every other person in history. 
and all authority in heaven and on earth is given to him. I mean, when the apostle John saw Jesus in a vision, perhaps you'll remember this description from, from Revelation 1. He says, I saw someone like the Son of Man wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His, his head and his hair were white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were like the flames of fire. His feet like polished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held the seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I was like, oh yeah, that's my homeboy. No, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his hand on me and said, listen, listen to the words of Jesus. Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Church, this is who Jesus is now, resurrected and in power. And the angel there on that Sunday morning, which, by the way, is why we're here on a Sunday morning and not a Saturday. The early church began to change the way they operated as a community because of the resurrection of Jesus. It was typical to worship on a Saturday. But if you've read the New Testament, the Apostle Paul would say, some worship on this day, some say you should worship on that day. I say you should treat every day as the Lord's day. But it was on Sunday that they began to gather to be a weekly reminder that we're here to worship a resurrected Savior. And it was on that Sunday where the angel says, listen, I want to invite you. Come and see where they laid his body. They, Joseph and Nicodemus, the men from chapter 15 who laid his body there. And it's interesting how John records in his gospel that the linen cloth that would have been wrapped around Jesus, as would have been wrapped around anyone who died at that time, they were left not as like an eight-year-old gets out of a bed where you're like, are there even sheets on this bed? But like, like he just went through them. They were perfectly laid there. The handkerchief that would have been placed over the head still rolled up in the shape of a head. This is not normal. And look at the direction given to the women from the angel in verse 7. Now go. Tell his disciples, listen to what he says here, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there, just as he told you before he died. Tell the disciples, he says, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him, just as he told you. Maybe you'll remember. A few weeks ago, we studied this passage together, that scene of Jesus with his disciples after they'd left the upper room and they're on their way to the garden right before the crucifixion. And Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples in chapter 14. He says, after I'm raised from the dead, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee. I'll meet you there. And Peter said, even, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times that you even knew me. No, Peter declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I'll never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. Interesting. Jesus told them before his death, before this resurrection, that he would see them again in Galilee. Peter speaks up. I'll never desert. I'll never deny. You can count on me. We know that's not what happened. The last thing that's recorded of Peter before the crucifixion is him saying, and I'll kind of soften the language that Peter would have used, but he would say, may God kill me and condemn me if I'm lying. I don't know Jesus. That was the language, a very soft interpretation of what he shared by that fire when that young girl pointed, aren't you one of... And the angel tells the women, tell the disciples, those who deserted, those who didn't measure up, those who scattered, those who faltered, those who flailed and failed, including Peter, 
Maybe you remember this, that the Gospel of Mark is kind of written firsthand from the account and the perspective of Peter. Mark's authoring these words. The angel tells them, Jesus, he's going to be with them, just like he said. For me, this reminds me of the grace and mercy and faithfulness of God. Like, Paul would write to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, if we're unfaithful, he's coming to get you. No. If we're unfaithful, he remains what, church? Faithful. For he cannot deny himself. Remember the parable of the shepherd who, who leaves the 99 to go after one. Peter is, is singled out in grace. And if I can have your attention on this, he does the same for me. He does the same for you. He does the same for us. Jesus died on the cross to remove the penalty of sin that we all owe. And he did it because he loves us. He doesn't need us. He wants us. Isn't that one of the most beautiful types of relationships to be in? When someone actually wants you. That's the relationship that God has with you. He doesn't need you. He desires you. Desires you so much that he would give his most precious relationship. Allow him to bear something that we can't intellectually discern what that was like. We can understand what crucifixion is what it looks like to be beat near the inch of your life with something called the flagellum, a whip that would have had bone and glass and metal kind of mixed into the threads and then whipped and pulled back from someone who is skilled in this kind of torture. We can kind of physically, intellectually understand that kind of torture. But to be the sin bearer of all humanity, that's a spiritual, psychological, emotional dynamic that none of us will ever be able to relate to. And that's what Jesus took upon himself so that you and I could be called God's kids, could walk with him, could have a relationship with him. And the angel says, go tell the disciples and don't forget about Peter. He's going to see them in Galilee. And I just want to share with you that God does the same for each of us. He calls us. He loves us. He's there for us. Well, what do the women do? Look at verse 8. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and beeps were going off, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And <laughs> I don't know what that is, but if anyone does. But, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. And then they briefly reported all this to Peter and his companions. The ladies are obviously shaken, right? They're amazed, they're bewildered, even trembling at this encounter. And Mark records that they said nothing because they were frightened. Now, now tune into this. We know from Luke chapter 24, and we'll see even in the next few verses, that they did eventually tell the disciples. But what this means is that when they left the tomb, it's not like they got together and to kind of just begin to talk amongst themselves. Like, like they just tried to discuss it and get their stories to match. It's just, it's just this kind of thing that they're just, they're completely flabbergasted by what they saw. An angel just spoke to us. The stone was rolled away. The body's gone. And, and then they simply went and reported to the disciples, just like the angels told them to do. Now, I want to share something about the rest of this text. We're going to end our time this morning in verse 14, but depending on which translation of the New Testament you have before you, you may or may not see a notation that some of the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament don't include half of verse 8, starting in verse 9, all the way through verse 20. And you may be asking, like, what is, what is this about? Well, let me share a little bit of context to you about this. 
Two of the oldest existing Greek manuscripts that we have, dated from 325 and 340 AD, don't contain this section, the, the tail end of Mark chapter 16. And neither do about a hundred other ancient manuscripts that are in other languages. However, these verses are included in a, in a great majority of ancient manuscripts. E even we have record of early Christian writers re referring to this passage, giving evidence that Christians were aware of the way the Gospel of Mark closed with the verses we're about to get into. Now, in these next few verses, th there's no new doctrine, new information, or anything given that contradicts anything else we see in Scripture. And no matter kind of where you land on this text, what I'd like to do is just read the remainder of our portion for today and kind of give you a summation, because that's kind of what happens here at the tail end of the Gospel of Mark, of what happened after Jesus' resurrection. Look at the, the second half of verse 8. Again, reading from the New Living Translation, it's recorded for us that afterward, Jesus himself sent them out from east to west with the sacred and unfailing message of salvation that gives eternal life. Amen. This is kind of the same thing that Matthew does in his gospel where Jesus commissions his disciples to make disciples by baptizing and teaching the things he taught them. He tells them to go into all the world. And this message of Jesus alone gives eternal life. Now, we're given three accounts of Jesus here in these next few verses appearing in his risen form. And there's kind of a theme that runs through each encounter. All three of these accounts, I believe, are very purposeful. Let's look at verses 9 through 11, the first one. First kind of encounter with resurrected Jesus. It says in verse 9 that after Jesus rose from the dead... Early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they did not believe her. The first person Jesus appears to, Mark says here, is Mary Magdalene. John chapter 20, I'd encourage you to, to crack that open maybe sometime this week. There's a very insightful and even tender description of how Jesus met with Mary in his resurrected form. And she doesn't recognize who it is until he calls her by name. And Mary finds the disciples, shares this, this story of meeting Jesus, and they don't believe her. And then we're given a second encounter that resurrected Jesus has. Look at verse 12. It says, Afterward, he appeared in a different form to two of his followers who were walking away from Jerusalem into the country. They rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. You can read this account, if you like, in Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 tells us that they didn't recognize Jesus, and it's, it's an amazing account. Let me read just a little bit of it to you. Starting in verse 27, it says, Then Jesus took them, these two guys who were traveling on a road to Emmaus, as it's commonly known, through the writings of Moses, the prophets, explaining from the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus, and at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, hey, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And listen to this description. At that moment, he disappeared. This is amazing. And we're told here that after this happened, they rushed to tell the others. But the same thing. No one believed them. And then we're kind of given a third and a final encounter that we'll consider this morning. It, it says in verse 14, still later, he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. And he rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him 
and after he'd been raised from the dead. Appears to the disciples. Eleven, because you remember Judas, the betrayer, is no longer with them. And these eleven disciples, apostles, after Jesus died... These weren't men at that time who were full of faith and, and acting fearless. The Bible tells us they kind of locked themselves in the upper room. The, the disciples, the disciples, the apostles who lived amazing lives after they encountered a resurrection of Jesus and, of, and eventually would become the fathers of the church, which I would submit to you over history ha has been the most impactful and enduring institution ever established, the church of Jesus Christ. Before the resurrection, before they get it, you know where they are? They're behind locked doors. They're afraid of the Jews. They, they thought they killed Jesus. We're next. They're in fear for their lives. They're, they're not brave men at this point. They're cowering. They're hiding. Do you remember the scene at the crucifixion? They all scattered. And Jesus, it records for us here, he rebukes them for their stubborn unbelief. What does that mean? They refuse to believe the testimony that Jesus was alive. Now, you might be considering all this and go, why these three accounts? These three accounts of Jesus appearing in his resurrected form, and then three times, same kind of response, unbelief. Well, let me share this with you. In the times that we live, the 21st century, there is really no serious debate about Jesus' existence. Jesus is one of the most validated lives of history, and the impact of his life is undeniable. But when it comes to the resurrection... Some question it. Why? Uh, because it's radical. When's the last time you saw a resurrection? Resuscitation, that's radical in and of itself. When someone comes back to life from struggling and fighting for their life. But resurrected, similar body but in a different form, that's glory. No, that doesn't happen. And most of human nature is skeptical. You can't invalidate the existence of Jesus. There is so much in works of antiquity that validate his existence, both sacred and non-sacred. But when it comes to the resurrection, it's radical. And some question, why? Let me share with you what one author says. He says, Christianity is so radical and life-changing that it should not be based on something normal. It should be based on something abnormal, something special, something supernatural. And since Christianity leads to a final and forever resurrection, it is appropriate for it to be based on Jesus' resurrection, the first resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is a miracle. Amen. Doesn't happen every day. And there have been a number of kind of strange and odd theories by those who can't accept the possibility that Jesus rose. Some have said, this is an old school theory called the swoon theory. Anyone ever heard of the swoon theory? Maybe once, one or two. It's that he fainted, you know? That he, he, he almost died on the cross, but revived a few days later. There's a lot of challenges <clears throat> with this theory. Number one, it's hard to imagine that when the soldier took his spear and thrust it into the side of Jesus and water and blood came out, kind of an indication that his heart had actually physically burst, that he was just kind of fainting at that time. Or also how he wriggled out of the grave clothes, 75, 100 pounds. How he moved a massive stone, departed from the grave, and then somehow convinced these kind of cowering disciples to suffer and die for him. That's a big leap. Some have said that Christians hallucinated Christ's resurrection. 500 at a time in one place? That's not how hallucinations work. They're not a group experience. Some say it was legend or myth adopted over time. Look at the works of antiquity. The, the, the works of antiquity that are written about the life of Christ are so close to the actual events. 
Nothing like that has ever happened in works of antiquity. Some say the body was stolen or they just got the wrong tomb that day. There's one that I think is kind of funny that Jesus, he had an identical twin brother. <laughs> Jesus and Bezos. Now I'm making up those names. But they're separated at birth, right? And after Jesus died, Bezos emerged and he, he told his disciples, pretend, no. The clearest explanation is a supernatural one. Does it take faith? Yes. Also takes faith this moment to believe that this ceiling's not going to drop in on top of us. It takes faith to hop on Highway 98 and make it to your destination, right? <laughs> Every act in life takes an element of trust. Every element of life. In Mark 16, I would say these three accounts, hang with me on this. We actually see one of the more astonishing reasons for Jesus' resurrection. You may, see, you may not be what you think. You say, what do you mean? It's the disbelief throughout this passage. You say, what do you mean by that? When the women reported what they saw, verse 11 tells us the others didn't believe him. When Jesus appeared to the two on the road and they go and tell others, people didn't believe. Jesus appearing before the 11, he rebukes them for what? For unbelief. You see, all this astonishment, unbelief, validates the resurrection because it's not at all how one would concoct a story. None of them are presented as hoping for a resurrection. None of them were clinging to Jesus' clear promises that he would rise on the third day. They didn't believe. And this honest account supports this as an accurate account. If you were trying to spin a yarn, create a myth, create a legend, in that culture... You wouldn't start with the testimony of women. In that culture and at that time, that was not valid testimony. What does Jesus do? The first people he appears to. This wasn't a hoax. This was a miracle. The resurrection of Jesus. And I want to share with you what I shared when we began our time in God's word together this morning. All that Jesus claimed to be, the way, the truth, the life, the very vine of life, where you find true meaning and purpose and satisfaction, the fact that he's the one who shepherds our very souls, all of this is proved by the resurrection. His resurrection makes it possible for us to be forgiven to have new life. I mean, again, let me share this with you from the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 4. He was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's his resurrection that proves who he is. And it's his resurrection that brings the possibility, like Romans chapter 6 would say, for new life for us to actually be experienced and enjoyed. It's in him. The resurrection of Jesus moves his story from being one of many throughout history to being the, with a capital T, story. And I want to encourage you this morning, in this season of Christmas, to place the full weight of your trust for forgiveness from sin, for a fresh start, for victory over sin, for hope for today in Jesus. He is the only one who qualifies to be the savior of the world. When you drove into campus this morning, if you came through that kind of main gate off Oriole Beach Road, you saw those red signs. It's all about Jesus. A savior has come. See, today, it's like Easter at Christmas because Jesus is risen risen from the dead. And that's what makes Christmas, that's what makes life as a believer alive and meaningful and powerful, fresh and real and possible to have a real, genuine relationship with God.